What's the current analysis on the relationship between China and Russia? Is it a temporary marriage of convenience or is it a, is it a long-term love affair? It is continuing to deepen. The heads of America's intelligence agencies on Wednesday testified that China will expand its cooperation with Russia in an effort to challenge the U.S., despite international condemnation of Moscow's war on Ukraine. Here's Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines. We don't see them becoming kind of allies the way we are with allies in NATO, but nevertheless, we do see increasing across every sector. Wednesday's hearing focused on worldwide threats and centered on the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. In brief, the CCP represents both the leading and most consequential threat to U.S. national security and leadership globally, and its intelligence-specific ambitions and capabilities make it for us our most serious and consequential intelligence rival. In recent weeks, the U.S. has publicly warned China against providing weapons to Russia as its forces mount a grinding offensive in Ukraine's east. Beijing has denied considering sending lethal aid to Moscow. DNI Haynes told the Senate Intelligence Committee that U.S. spy services were watching closely for signs China might be directly, but not publicly, supporting Russia. We do see them providing assistance to uh, Russia in the context of the conflict. And we see them uh, in a situation in which they become increasingly uncomfortable about the level of assistance and not looking to um, do it as publicly as uh, might otherwise occur. Haynes said Chinese President Xi Jinping views the U.S. as an adversary in achieving his regional objectives. To fulfill Xi's vision, however, the CCP is increasingly convinced that it can only do so at the expense of U.S. power and influence, and by using coordinated whole-of-government tools to demonstrate strength and compel neighbors to acquiesce to its preferences, including its land, sea, and air claims in the region and its assertions of sovereignty over Taiwan. Xi blamed the West for China's economic difficulties in a speech on Monday, in which he accused the United States of leading an international effort to contain China. Despite Xi's recent sharp criticism of the United States, Haynes said U.S. intelligence still asserts that Beijing believes it benefits from a stable relationship with Washington. How do we make that case, but do you start with the accepting the premise that national security has to include um, um, who wins each of these technology dom domains. I, I wholeheartedly agree that technology and economic security have become inextricably intertwined with national security uh, and the efforts this committee has made uh, and that a lot of us in the intelligence community have made to engage the private sector uh, I think are essential to that and we just have to keep doubling down on that. You could just look uh, at, for example, on the cyber side, our critical infrastructure is and 85 percent of it or something is in the hands of the private sector. And if you look at our innovation, if you look at our PII, our personal identifiable information, the percentage is even higher. And if you look at what the Chinese are trying to steal, that's where it is. So we need to be working more and more closely with the business community to try to build resilience. I think there have been a lot of progress that's been made, but we need to make more. Our work with the private sector in this space is particularly important as, you know, uh, over my lifetime, I have seen increasingly the innovation of critical foundational technologies occurring in the context of the private sector and our capacity to work with them to understand essentially what is what those innovations are and how we can help them protect themselves in this context is another aspect of this that has to be focused on and something we spend a lot of time on. Um, I think the revolution in technology is not only the main arena for competition with the People's Republic of China, it's also the main determinant of our future as an intelligence service as well. Um, as you know, we've undertaken a number of innovations over the last couple of years to strengthen our capacity on that revolution in technology for the first time appointing a chief technology officer, for the first time establishing an, a CIA-wide technology strategy, creating a new mission center focused largely on technology, and as my colleagues emphasized, building better partnerships, stronger partnerships with the private sector as well as with academia, creating a technology fellows program, because we have to be more flexible in our employment practices as well to attract mm -hmm. Um, people who are accomplished in the private sector and the tech sector who may be interested in a couple of years of public service as well. And we're deeply interested in trying to attract um, those kind of people as well. That does mean we may need to redirect some of the, the resources. I mean, the, the idea of China's extraction of cobalt out of the DRC and how they're going to get it 
back to China becomes a national security issue. The question of China flooding the zone on standard setting bodies to define the next technology rules for beyond 5G to kind of ORAN, open radio access networks, next generation wireless is a national security concern. You know, who's leading the way on biotech innovation becomes a national security concern. And I think we need to make sure that we are both reporting on this and that we are engaging uh, our private sector partners. I, I agree with Senator Rubio. Too many of our, uh, of our corporate world still believes that, um, uh, that these collaborations inside of China are, are benign, uh, even though when they turn a blind eye to the literally unprecedented amounts of intellectual property theft, uh, too often because they're making way too much money on investing in China tech. Some of that has changed, um, but this is an ongoing challenge. Uh, the most downloaded app in the world, one of the most downloaded app in the world is a social media company, TikTok. Um, could the Chinese government, through its ownership of ByteDance, that owns ByteDance US, if they wanted to, and, and, and ByteDance US were willing to cooperate or forced to cooperate, could, the, could they use TikTok to control data on millions of users? Uh, yes. Could they use it to control the software on millions of devices, given the opportunity to do so? Yes. Could they use it to drive narratives, uh, like to divide Americans against each other? For example, let's say China wants to invade Taiwan to make sure that Americans are seeing videos arguing why Taiwan belongs to China and why the U.S. should not intervene? Yes, and I would make the point on that last one in particular that we're not sure that we would see many of the outward signs of it happening if it was happening. And I think the thing that the most fundamental piece that cuts across every one of those risks and threats that you mentioned that I think Americans need to understand is that something that's very sacred in our country, the difference between the private sector and the public sector, that's a line that is non-existent in the way the CCP operates. This is a substantial national security threat for the country of a kind that we didn't face in the past. So we're still, it's, at the end of the day, it's not about, you know, some grown man in the middle of the day putting up videos, you know, that people that have a job shouldn't be putting up. But it's also about all these other things that we've talked about, the data, the ability to manipulate information. I would imagine that if, it's probably one of the most valuable surveillance tools on the planet. I mean, if we went out and decided to build something like this of our own to influence or spy on another society, I'm not sure we could build something like this or even better. We, and we've invited them in and protected them by our laws. So I, I don't understand why this company is allowed to operate. Perhaps needless to say, the People's Republic of China, which is increasingly challenging the United States economically, technologically, politically, and militarily around the world, remains our unparalleled priority. Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, under President Xi Jinping, will continue efforts to achieve Xi's vision of making China the preeminent power in East Asia and a major power on the world stage. To fulfill Xi's vision, however, the CCP is increasingly convinced that it can only do so at the expense of US power and influence, and by using coordinated whole of government tools to demonstrate strength and compel neighbors to acquiesce to its preferences, including its land, sea, and air claims in the region and its assertions of sovereignty over Taiwan. In brief, the CCP represents both the leading and most consequential threat to US national security and leadership globally, and its intelligence-specific ambitions and capabilities make it for us our most serious and consequential intelligence rival. During the past year, the threat has been additionally complicated by a deepening collaboration with Russia, which also remains an area, obviously of intense focus for the intelligence community. The Russians are making incremental progress on Bakhmut, which is not a particularly strategic objective, but are otherwise facing considerable constraints, including personnel and ammunition shortages, dysfunction within the military's leadership, exhaustion, as well as morale challenges. And even as the Russian offensive continues, they are experiencing high casualty rates. Putin is likely better understanding the limits of what his military is capable of achieving and appears to be focused on more modest military objectives for now. In short, we do not foresee the Russian military recovering enough this year to make major territorial gains, but Putin most likely calculates that time works in his favor and that prolonging the war, including with potential pauses in the fighting, may be his best remaining pathway to eventually securing Russia's strategic interests in Ukraine, even if it takes years. As I'm sure, I know you're familiar with this, uh the most downloaded app in the world, one of the most downloaded app in the world is a social media company, TikTok. 
Um, could the Chinese government, through its ownership of ByteDance, that owns ByteDance US, if they wanted to, and, and, and ByteDance US were willing to cooperate or forced to cooperate, could, the, could they use TikTok to control data on millions of users? Uh, yes. Could they use it to control the software on millions of devices, given the opportunity to do so? Yes. Could they use it to drive narratives, uh, like to divide Americans against each other? For example, let's say China wants to invade Taiwan to make sure that Americans are seeing videos arguing why Taiwan belongs to China and why the U.S. should not intervene? Yes, and I would make the point on that last one in particular that we're not sure that we would see many of the outward signs of it happening if it was happening. And I think the thing that the most fundamental piece that cuts across every one of those risks and threats that you mentioned that I think Americans need to understand is that something that's very sacred in our country, the difference between the private sector and the public sector, that's a line that is non-existent in the way the CCP operates. I'd really like uh, Director Nakasone to be able to share a little bit about what 702 really is and the reason why it is so important that we reauthorize 702. Senator, uh, 702 allows the U.S. intelligence community to collect communications of foreigners operating outside the United States that utilize U.S. infrastructure and services. Because they're using platforms that have a nexus to our communication systems within the United States? That's correct. Could you explain the reverse targeting prohibition and specifically what it prevents the government from doing? So if one of, uh, one of our analysts in the U.S. intelligence community says, hey, I want to be able to get to someone in the United States, but I'll go ahead and just target this person outside the United States as a way around it. We do not allow that. In fact, we check that very, very carefully. It's audited. It's... it's you know, it's uh, double-checked and triple-checked. It's interesting. When we make a mistake, we investigate, we mitigate, and then we report on it. That's the type of uh, attention we pay to this authority. 